thank everyone for their flexibility uh, today. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know uh, as we shared, a lot of the schools were closed, a lot of businesses went to remote, and the the storm is expected to begin towards the end of our meeting. So I just thought it would be better uh, if we went remote. And thank you again, Chris, for your flexibility. Uh, if I can ask uh, before to do our reflection and pledge this morning. Sure. So uh, let's do the reflection first. I'm just very grateful for this opportunity to be together with everybody. It's good for us to see Dan. Dan, I'm so glad you're here. And I'm also very grateful that we had the opportunity to meet remotely. Um, I was planning to come, but when the weather was getting bad, I had decided not to come. And, you know, thanks to this pesky old technology, we've been able to make this meeting after all. And I'm just thankful for all the Rotarians and all the good that we do in the world. Amen. Let's pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and, and justice, justice for all. all. Thank you very much, B. You're welcome. Uh, we uh, had had an induction planned for today. Um, we're going to move that not to next week, but to the following week when we are back at the Double Tree. But uh, again, want to uh, welcome Tom Tappan uh, to the club uh, as one of our newest members. Uh, welcome again, Tom. Um, <clears throat> just a reminder, next week's meeting will be at the Igloo. Please go out to DACDB and sign up for the meeting so we have a, a, an accurate account of who's able to attend. And I don't see, I don't see if Lisa's on here or not, but uh, we do have a social coming up, correct? In, uh, yeah, Lisa's in Lisa's got, she's got a um, conflict. She's in another meeting, but yes, we do have a social coming up. Okay. What do you remember the date on that, Lisa Marie? Uh, it's in the, the year the twenty yeah something. I I don't have the gear up right now. It's okay. the thirtieth. It's the thirtieth. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Patty. Uh -huh. It's the thirtieth. Um, and I I did not have any other announcements. Oh oh, except for uh, Lisa Marie. I if you wanted to talk about RLI. Yes, thank you. So um, I'm really excited to share with everybody. We've got quite a contingency heading to RLI this weekend. I think there's six or eight of us last count um, that will be going Saturday. And for those of you who are not familiar, um, RLI is the Rotary Leadership Institute, or they refer to it as Rotary Learning Institute. And I know B's very involved with that. Dean Scott's involved with it. Um, and it's just a really great uh, learning experience for Rotarians, new Rotarians to those who have been Rotarians for quite some time. They usually have graduate programs. So um, we have folks attending RLL one, two, three, and graduate level. Um, so our club will be well represented and we will be learning about everything from the nuts and bolts membership to social media, you name it. Um, and even better, we get to um, network and, uh, um, and break bread with fellow Rotarians around the state. So it's really a, it's an awesome thing. And if you've never been and you're a Rotarian for more than five years, I would encourage you to go. And for those of you who are under five years, I would strongly encourage you to go. So um, hope you'll be joining, if not this one, the next one, but we've got a great group going on the 13th. And thank you, President Leslie. I'll, I'll, I'll bring back all of, all of the information we learned. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Lisa Marie or Jen, did you wanna talk about Rala a little bit? Is Jen on? I didn't see her. Hi, let's see. <laughs> I just joined. Hi, Jen. I, hi. 
I didn't hear Leslie what oh, you wanted. Oh, sorry. To say to me. I asked if he, it, did you want to talk about Ryla? Um, I don't have any information about Ryla. I'll I'll jump in then. Okay. All right. So, um, Rotary Youth Leadership is um, just around the corner. So, as a club, we usually nominate two high school students to attend this training um, training opportunity for high school juniors and seniors. Um, last year, we sent two folks from Wolfson High School. Um, and we are in the process right now. Um, Lynn Bauman is reaching out to Bishop Kinney to see if we can get two candidates who we would sponsor to attend. It, it's a great opportunity for teenagers. It's something wonderful for them to put on their resume. There is always a, um, a fundraising, a fundraising, a, a charity event um, that they uh, incorporate. Last year, it was um, the meal packing. And I'm not sure if they're going to be doing the same event, but um, it was a really good event and always is. So uh, we're working on that right now. Great. And and my apologies, I, I should have said Lynn and not Jen. So sorry about that. <laughs> uh, that is it for any announcements, unless someone else has anything that they'd like to bring up before we uh, introduce our speaker. Just real quick, um, Barry, I don't want to steal your thunder if you want to do Family of Rotary. I, I did want to just ask everybody to to keep, um, um, oh my goodness gracious, my brain just went blank. Danny. Katie Bowling in, in your prayers. You want to take Danny it, Barry? Walker. And always Danny right now. Danny's, um, Danny's in hospice, um, for those of you who don't know. So um, Katie's having surgery and should have a quick recovery. Um, and then Danny is in hospice right now, and um, just just we're all standing by from friends and family. You did Great. a nice job. <laughs> Thank you. Great. And uh, the uh, visitors and guests, I know Odette has introduced her guest. Uh, does anyone else have any guests joining us today? Great. Okay. Well, I will turn it over to Ron Patrick. Yes. Thank you for uh, to uh, everybody, and uh, I'm delighted today to welcome our speaker, Chris Fisher. Uh, Chris is the founder, chairman, and expedition leader of OSEARCH, uh, which is a global nonprofit organization. Uh, the mission of OSEARCH is to accelerate the ocean's return to balance and abundance through fearless innovations in critical scientific research, education, outreach, and policy using unique collaborations of individuals and organizations in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, since founding OSEARCH in 2007, Fisher's team has engaged with more than 190 researchers from global institutions, safely tagged more than 400 animals, and worked globally with partners across varying sectors. OSEARCH has advanced science through 75 peer-reviewed papers, 20 of which Fisher is a co-author. In the spirit of including a global audience in his work, the OSEARCH Shark, Tra Shark Tracker launched in 2013, allowing nearly 2 million annual users to learn about sharks while tracking them across the planet in near real time. Further, a STEM curriculum based on the tracker contains more than 100 lesson, lesson plans and is made available at osearch.org. A graduate of Indiana University, uh, Chris began his career as an explorer as host uh, of the four-time Emmy Award-winning Offshore Adventures from 2001 to 2009. It was the number one watched outdoor TV series and had the goal of pouring the oceans back into people's lives. <clears throat> From 2009 to 2012, uh, Chris hosted 20 hours of TV episodes on the National Geographic Channel and 10 hours on the History Channel, chronicling the research of, on the white shark. Uh, Chris has received numerous prestigious recognitions, including the Explorers Club Lowell Thomas Medal for Im Imagination and Exploration, and the Nominee Trust 100 Award for Top Social Innovators, uh, truck, uh, Innovators List. Uh, further, OSEARCH has been founded in more than 10, 000, has been founded in more than 10,000 outlets, in, or featured in more than 10,000 outlets, I'm sorry, 
including the New York Times, CNN, CBS Morning News, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, 60 Minutes, and most major news media organizations worldwide. Please join me in providing a very warm Rotary Club of South Jacksonville welcome to Mr. Chris Fisher. Oh, very kind of you. We got to get you a shorter bio. <laughs> <laughs> Pick one of two things. Well, I appreciate you all having me here. Uh, you live in a very special place uh, when it comes to the ocean and when it comes to the land and the people there. So I'm thrilled to be, you know, calling Jacksonville one of the future homes of OSEARCH, the future world headquarter home of OSEARCH at Jacksonville University. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later, but we'll get through this because I know everybody is at home and I'm going to try to share a presentation with you guys. And we'll talk a little bit about OSEARCH and how it all got going and how it's going to end up being the home of OSEARCH is Jacksonville. All right. Can you guys see my screen okay? You can? Yes. Great. Yes, we can. Yes. yes. Okay, so a lot of the history of how this got started was was in that bio. You know, I come from a super entrepreneurial family and then had this passion for the water, found an opportunity to begin working on the water, making TV shows in the late 90s and early 2000s to kind of live my passion and um, began to notice some things while we were making that TV show. I began to understand that uh, we had real challenges on the water. We, we have a huge knowledge gap between the practical knowledge of professional and full-time watermen and our science. The fishermen are about 30 years ahead of the scientists in most cases around the world. You know, they're out there every day, they understand what's going on and the data has not been collected to be able to review all of these super dynamic situations so it can be published. And that's the kind of information we use to manage for policy. So I began to talk to scientists and help scientists who study things, and they began to say, man, our single biggest challenge is data deficit. We don't have the information to manage fish back. And in particular, they started around 2006 when I was making the show. I was helping people study billfish and other things while we made the show, because I quickly learned the scientists have no money, and they have no boats, and they don't know how to catch what they study. Uh, but we need them to, to produce these peer-reviewed papers. And there was this massive gap. I mean, these poor scientists are sent out there on a mission to, to write these papers for the benefit of all of us. But then they're basically given no tools to do so other than like whatever they studied. So they study, they come out as a scientist, and then they got to figure out, well, oh, I got to catch a fish, or I need to run a boat, or I need to find a fish. And they have no idea how to do that. So we started to see that if we brought the fishermen and the, and the scientists together, we could radically change the rate at which we were learning. So we are, it became clear as I was doing offshore adventures and I was evolving as a human and starting a family um, that we could do a lot more than just make a TV show on a shiny white boat, you know, and have fancy food. And we had done that. We did that 188 times over about nine years, made a bunch of those episodes, but really began to see an opportunity to make a real difference in the future abundance of the ocean. So, and I am an abundance guy. And I think that's what's interesting about OSEARCH. I oftentimes say, you know, sharks found us. I'm not a shark guy. You know, I grew up chasing fish and frogs in the woods of Kentucky. And that passion for the water transferred to Florida when my parents brought us down here on holiday and we had a place and still do. And then, um, and then that the love grew on the ocean and just began to expand the horizons of the roots of which was just farm ponds and creeks in Kentucky. A passion for the water, a passion for the system around it and making sure it thrives so our kids can see it too. And perhaps we can make it a lot better because we know more now. So the real mission began, it's like practical and academic colliding so that we can overcome data deficit. Why sharks? Here's a little clip on why sharks. We don't have any audio on this. I'm not sure if there's supposed to be audio with it. Oh, yeah, my computer is playing audio. You can't. No. It's not playing it out to the, the feed. It's just playing it on your computer. All right. 
right. Well, I will try to. Um, can you I hear it now? We can't see the video though, Chris. Can you hear it? Could you hear it there at the end? Try it again. Can you hear it now? No. No. We can okay. just see it. Fortunately, that particular video, um, the, you didn't need the audio, but I want to try to get you audio for these other. I think I'm going to have to escape out of this. Just give me one second. If I can't do it, we'll do it without audio, okay? Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. When you share your screen, there's a little box in the corner. You can click share sound. Oh, okay. That's what I needed. Share your screen, share sound. Brilliant. Thank you for the okay. tip. Okay. You're welcome. It's a fascinating video. We want to see all of it. Okay. You want to see that again, but it's just music in the background. That one has no speaking. That's okay. Play it from the beginning. Got it now? Yeah, you might have to turn your speakers up a little. You can't hear too good. Got good audio. That's it. We can hear it. Yep. So it became really clear really fast that this that this big challenge that we were dealing with, which was data deficit, was was really easy to overcome for me as an outsider, because I don't come from the nonprofit space. It's just like how you'd run any business. You've got to bring the right talent together. And we were bringing it around this idea that the scientists made it very clear to us we were our oceans were we were losing our fish when we'd lost our sharks. Like the wolf in Yellowstone, if the shark is there, it balanced the system toward maximum abundance. But what the scientists came to us in like uh, the 2006 period and said, man, we're down to 9% of our large sharks. And if we don't fix the large shark thing, there will be no fish. And, you know, our recreational and our fishing economies will collapse. And then, you know, that falls into other things. If the ocean's not working correctly, not only is there no food, but it provides us two thirds of our air and all of our water. So if these systems collapse, how does it affect the ocean system and basically our capacity to survive on land? A lot of people don't understand how the shark impacts things. Uh, just to give you a, br a few brief real practical things so it can resonate with people. We know up north when white sharks are present, every seal on the beach eats one fourth as much per day. So if the white sharks aren't there, the seals just ravage the fish stocks. They wipe out the cod, they wipe out the bait, they wipe out the stripers. There's no food for us. Down here in the south, the primary impact off your all's beaches is the sharks keep the squid down at night. If the sharks aren't present, the squid rise to the surface every night, as they do. And with no sharks to put some pressure on them to keep them down, they eat all of our fry. So they eat all the baby tuna and baby cobia, baby wahoo, baby billfish, because there's nowhere to hide out there. So what happens is, yes, the, the sharks eat some seals and yes, they eat squid. But the real fact is you need their presence in number because just the presence of the shark affects the behavior of everything else, which tunes the system into maximum abundance. So that's really the thing to understand. And, and what you can see, like we, our seals are raging back. Huge success story. We've saved our whales. We've saved our seals. We've saved our turtles. We've saved our marine mammals. And the volume of seals that's increasing its range down the East Coast right now is stretching all the way down into, you know, like Delaware and below, whereas they were above Massachusetts, right? So as their population rebuilds, their range continues to expand, which is going to make it all the way down to Cape Hatteras. So you can imagine a northern half of our coast covered with seals with no white sharks, there would be no food. So um, 
So that's why it's so important to bring these sharks back from the brink. That's why we pivoted from making TV shows about big game fishing to enabling scientists to answer these bigger, harder questions to try to make an effort for all of our kids to be able to eat a fresh fish sandwich and see an ocean full of fish. And so that is how it all began. And so they then they then began to like explain to me, okay, if you're going to try to make a, a move to help us with global abundance, which is this large shark thing, there's nine white shark populations around the world. If we could understand the life of the white shark in those nine regions as the apex predator, and we manage them back, we manage the whole system back. So this is just like leveraging the wolf for Yellowstone or the lion for the Serengeti. It's just a much more complex data set to get because it's a large animal underwater. It's much easier to study these terrestrial animals. You know, we got our, we leverage our lions to save the Serengeti, right? We bring them back, we bring that system back. The wolves in Yellowstone, we bring them back. The abundance of Yellowstone goes up 4,000%, right? And so, so it's the same idea, but the challenge was at the time, back when we were looking at this, no one had ever solved one of the life history puzzles of the white shark in any of these populations. It was said to be impossible. They were too big. We can't figure out where they give birth and where they mate and what they're eating and where they are. It's just never been done. It's impossible. But I was fascinated by this idea. Okay, there's nine white shark life, you know, populations around the world. They're all separate. And if we can give those communities the data set to manage those, lot, those white shark populations back, we can assist them in managing back that whole region because these things have massive ranges. So that was the plan. Save the oceans by bringing, you know, solving the puzzle of the large sharks, which has never been done before, nine puzzles around the world to make a global impact. The challenge at the time, the scientists knew nothing. And these nine populations around the world uh, none had, did we have the life history described. Um, and in some of them, there's little parts and pieces of the puzzle, but due to lack of collaboration and the scientists, again, don't have the capacity they need, they can't answer the more basic questions like where are they born? How big is the nursery? Like if you can't answer that question, you cannot manage them. And so we have the first people ever to identify the primary nursery of a population of white sharks in a birthing site. Our, our, our way to attack this was going to be do it different than the typical nonprofit. It was going to be a, like a little bit more of an entrepreneurial nonprofit. And all this was developing at the same time, like Twitter and Google and those sorts of things were emerging around 2008, 2009, 2010. And they had an interesting business strategy, right? It was create the product, give the product away and create radical scale and monetize the scale, not the product. That's what Google is, right? It's free. They give you the product, you use it. They monetize you. They monetize the scale around their brand. And so I was like, wow, wouldn't it be interesting to approach ocean research that way instead of these closed ivory towers and no one knows who's doing what, you know, why don't, what if we just open source the whole thing? And instead of people working in individual silos because of publisher Paris, it's where they were forced to work, the system's broken. Let's just create more entrepreneurial, open, inclusive, open source project. Following the model of what was happening with a lot of these big social platforms and trying to redefine and disrupt the um, research space to make it more productive so we could close knowledge gaps. And so what we started to see was that if we brought the fishermen and the scientists together, as you can see here in this clip, um, the fishermen bring the, the shark into the cradle. This is about a 3,500 pound female white shark, you know, that the scientists have no idea how to, you know, deal with. But I have a few salty guys, you know, that I've known as I've worked around the world. And these are the kind of guys, you know, don't send them a budget or an email, but ask them to catch a 4,000 pound white shark, no problem. Right. So when you can bring these practical skills, the trade skills and elevate your appreciation for those, because without those guys creating safe access to these white sharks, there is no success in management. You got to get one. Right. But somehow the trades have been diminished. And so that's just not right in this. We need to the skill of these fishermen and these watermen who can operate the ship around the world and catch the uncatchable so that then the scientists can collect data and publish papers so we can then manage toward abundance 
was a big part of the disconnect in the system and the fishermen had just kind of been thrown by the wayside. Meanwhile, they know they're 30 years ahead of the scientists in their practical understanding of what's going on out there. And they are the pathway to collecting data around that so it can be leveraged for management. So it was all gonna be built around collaboration. And this is what it looks like when you get great collaboration and a team of scientists coming together with a team of fishermen around a large mature female white shark and everything goes smoothly. When you handle an animal of this size, it'll hit you in a completely different way from an emotional standpoint. You feel this aweness and respect for the animal, its ancientness, its wisdom, what it's done to provide for us all, a deep level of respect. This is what the body and the makeup of a fully mature female white shark looks like. Likely around a 50 year old fish, well over 3000 pounds. She's probably had 15 reproductive cycles, which means she's had maybe up to a hundred babies. And some of those babies now are, you know, old enough to be making babies and they're sexually mature. So she would be, you know, a, a proper and true matriarch of the ocean, a grandmother of sharks. So when you look at a, you know, a video like that, you can see that it takes a lot of different skill sets to come together to answer these questions so we can deliver a positive future for our kids. It takes the skill sets of watermen, it takes the skill sets of scientists, it takes the skill sets of philanthropists and universities, corporate sponsors, and all of these people to come together and share it with everyone. And then all of a sudden, these things that they said were impossible become very easy, very easy. It's just about creating a common vision a common vision with an O search or a great uh, with an ocean or a great grandchildren disposition, you know, grandchildren first. And, and then, you know, suddenly people came together around this. And here's an example of the leap forward in data collection, which has led to many of the 80 peer reviewed papers we have now. And this, in this image on the left-hand side, the small one of the coast, in 2012, believe it or not, we did not know white sharks were in Florida, other than the fishermen saying they saw them out there, which the science doesn't accept. I mean, literally, when we tagged the first shark in Cape Cod in 2012, we guessed on where it would go, and no one said Florida. And now, here we are just 10 years later with 92 animals their full range having been discovered, understanding how much we're interacting with them, how much they're not, what areas are critical to the future, where they're putting pressure on the seals, where they mating, where they birthing. So you got this track, right? That, that, that gives you the range and it starts to let you know where to look. First thing is like, holy cow, look at the range. These things are balancing the ocean all the way from Newfoundland to the Gulf of Mexico. It's very common for us to have animals to migrate 20 to 25,000 miles a year. And so 100 miles a day is normal for them. Just that's like us walking casually through the forest. And so now the key is this tracking tells you where they are, but what are they doing where they are? And that's why we layered all the science beyond the tracking, right? We do 25 research projects on every animal. Everyone gets fascinated by the tracking because it's real time and the whole world can watch in on their phone and a free app or online. But the real thing is the other science tells you what they're doing where they are, whether it's the sperm sample from the male and whether or not it's motile, you know, and viable, uh, the blood samples from the males and the females. So you can test the estrogen in the females, the testosterone in the males to see when their hormones are peaking. So you can try to nail down on mating, right? And then all of the toxicology work. We have a whole human health program where we're developing new antibiotics from the bacteria off of the skin and the teeth and the tongue of these animals. So there's all these other things. And all this other science is what gives you this. This is what you're looking for. And this is the only map in the world that exists in any of the nine white shark populations. What this basically shows you is the small purple dot there right south of Long Island in the New York, New Jersey bite. That's where they're born. And that's their primary nursery. They stay there until 
They're born in the late uh, spring, early summer, and they stay there till the late fall when it cools down off the New York, New Jersey coast, right there on the South Shore, Long Island, the Hamptons, all that stuff. When it cools down, they slide down and their primary winter nursery is off of um, the Outer Banks and stretches as far down as to the South Carolina border off North Carolina. That's where they spend their first winter every year. So they're moving between those two places in their first year of life. This is the most important thing and place to look after them, right? The bigger they get, the tougher they get, the more resilient they get, the more they can you know, survive on their own, break off lines and so forth. Now, what's pretty interesting about this is these animals start with that little bounce between New York and North Carolina in their first year. And then as they grow, they expand that range. And by the time they're just four years old, they're traveling all the way from Newfoundland to the Gulf of Mexico across this entire range. Now, they'll do that for the first 20 years of their life because these animals aren't sexually mature till they're 20. They can't have babies till then. They can't mate. They got to live 20 years just to replace themselves. Then we see that our data is indicating that somewhere between, you know, central Florida here at Jack's and off the southeastern United States and up into the lower outer banks, that's the only hits we've got on elevated hormones and uh, fully developed sperm samples from a male. Now, they weren't fully developed. They were 60 percent to where we think peak is on the hormones as well as the sample. And that was taken on March 1st off Hilton Head. And so... The question is, is it 60% and they're coming off their peak of mating or is it 60% and they're moving up toward their peak of mating? That's what that's the last question we have to answer. We believe that it's you know more towards spring, but we don't know. So the last question we're trying to answer exactly when is mating occurring? It's off the southeastern United States. We know they're 60% of the way there in the first of March. We just don't know if they're going up or coming down. And we're trying to nail that. So, because no one's ever identified a white shark mating area, it's never been done. So, we believe they're mating there once they're 20. And when they do successfully mate, the female shoots offshore into this big kind of area in the middle of the ocean where she gestates, leads a low risk lifestyle, dies deep, moves with the deep scattering layer up and down every day and just grows her baby. She doesn't want to interact with other white sharks, other males, because it's uh, uh, very violent, right? And she's already successfully made it. Once she's been out there, I think we're going to rewrite shark history right now. It says white sharks have an 18-month gestation. That's the scientist's best guess off previous data. I think we're going to see that's more like 14 months. And we see the sharks then, these big females, move into the New York, New Jersey bite in the late spring and early summer and drop their pups off and the whole thing starts over. For the males, for the males, it's very simple. They're born, they expand their range, and they just keep moving up and down the coast because their migratory journey is never interrupted with gestation, right? So they don't have to pause for a 14-month gestation. So that after the females are sexually mature, after about 20, it turns their big migratory move into more of a two-year loop with a year of it um, being gestating and birthing, whereas the males just have a regular annual loop that they go back and forth, much simpler pattern. Uh, what was interesting when we did this is, you know, we open sourced it all so that people could track the sharks in real time and the students just piled in. We have thousands and thousands of students and homeschoolers using our free educational curriculum that you can download off the app. It's a full STEM-based curriculum, next generation st science standard integrated into the real science projects as well as the tracker. So it makes the, the education more dynamic. You know, you can go look and see and calculate how far a shark moved today, how fast did it have to go, and all those various things while you're learning about oceanography and physics and various other things. So the educational component of OSEARCH, this is the K through 12 component. Um, whereas, you know, the college kids and the PhDs and then, and then beyond the professionals are all actually working on the projects with us. This has been a, a, a really great, a, a great program and it continues to grow because the kids are fascinated with the sharks and they come to see the sharks and the next thing they know, they're, they're learning physics, you know, whereas it was hard to get them interested in physics if you didn't have an angle. So the shark seems to be an angle to get these kids more interested in STEM subjects. So now the question is, as we wrap up here off of this coast, uh, you know, what's next? Well, the next place we're going to begin sending the ship over and dabbling, you'll see us next year, is going over to Europe to see if we can find, no one has ever captured, sampled, or tagged a Mediterranean white shark. 
And if we want to bring the med back and we want to bring back Western Europe, we got to bring back the white shark. There's just, and the med is dead. And that's just not okay. We got to turn the corner on that. So this is a different one. While we have this really emerging robust resource off our coast, our sharks are slowly coming back. We are winning. That's the biggest thing I want you to share with your community. We have more fish off our coast and around our coast and estuaries today than since the 1940s. Our ocean is back. Our ocean is turning into one of the great wild oceans. No one alive today has seen as many fish and whales and turtles and seals as we have now. And in the midst of all this doom and gloom stuff that you hear, which nonprofits peddle because doom and gloom, you know, when the sky is falling, cash flows. And so, but we're winning and our kids need to know we're winning. They have a robust future off the East coast of the United States and the Gulf of Mexico. We are the model for the world and we are trending, 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 and it's just going to get better. And, and, and no one alive today has seen the amount of fish in life that we have in our oceans as of now. The, both our Atlantic coast, Pacific coast is maybe five years behind it, but um, we're going to deliver a beautiful, abundant ocean to our children in our country. And it is the model uh, for the rest of the world. Over in the Med, it's a different situation. We're going over there to try to find one of the last white sharks before they're completely wiped out. But we have to start there because if we can't get there, if you if you get the ecosystem right so that the predator can move across it and succeed, what happens is you end up getting the ecosystem right for a lot of the things that end up living underneath them, you know, within the system, the tuna and everything else and the, and the whale and the bait as is, is, is benefits because the seals got the pressure on them and then the game fish come back. So you got to start with a white shark over there, different mission, trying to save them before they're gone. So that's going to be the hardest thing we've ever, ever tried. And then there are seven more to go after that. If we can solve these nine white shark populations and the eight remaining, and we can begin to manage those white sharks back, we will manage global abundance back. That's the play. That is the play. This is a global abundance play. Um, we are super thrilled uh, to have been partnered with Jacksonville University since 2017. And that partnership is now beginning to formalize itself at another level because Mayport and the city of Jacksonville built us a $5.6 million dock and gave us 2.8 acres of land down in Mayport on a 50-year you know, lease. And we're doing that with Jacksonville University. And the state of Florida gave us $5 million this past year to begin the construction of the new OSEARCH World Headquarter rescue research and education facility in Mayport. So we're super excited. You'll see later this year, the ship will start to show up and be there more full time. And then we're hoping to break ground on the um, buildings by the summer of next of this year. So super exciting for the first time to have an OSEARCH world headquarters at Jacksonville University. What this is really doing is this is setting up OSEARCH to be institutionalized, right? Making sure it can transcend any individual's lifespan. Uh, because if OSEARCH went away, there is no other program out there doing this sort of work and collecting this kind of data. They just simply don't have the capacity. So that is very exciting. You know, and I think in the end, and I'll wrap it up here, I'm trying to stay with the shortened schedule. Um, you know, the one thing I learned, a lot of life lessons, you know, over the years, but when it comes to abundance and success and what we leave behind, it really comes down to one of these things my mom and dad used to talk about at the dinner table all the time. This is really one of those missions that's like anything's possible if you don't care who gets the credit. I mean, we got people with agendas and it doesn't matter. It just has to be done. And when you can bring people together around the concept of a common vision with the grandchildren first disposition and not caring who gets the credit, things that people say are impossible become very easy to achieve. And the next thing you know, you know, you're in a place you never dreamed at with 80 peer reviewed papers and you feel like you're just getting started. So it's a, uh, it's a very, it's a very exciting time for OSEARCH. Our biggest challenge continues to be the scientists have no money and no um, boats. And so we provide the ship to all the scientists for free. So what we do is that we, we have to go out and we have to raise the money 
to fund the ship and then we give it to all the scientists. So our challenge every year is, is just trying to keep the ship so that we can give it to the scientists. But when it comes to the world headquarters and integrating with JU, we're gonna have a new boat start getting built next year for the JU facility. You're gonna have world-class rescue research and uh, education there. It's gonna be a mini woods hole of the South right there in Mayport. It's gonna be transformational for the region and for OSEARCH as well. So I thank you all for having me. Thanks for hosting us. You live in a special spot. Our white sharks are likely mating on the reefs offshore here in the springtime. And if we look after the ocean here, we're actually looking after the ocean across the entire eastern seaboard for all Americans and people who live in Atlantic Canada. So know that you live in a special place and take your kids down to the beach and have an abundance party. Share the news. Our I, one last comment. I speak to students and children all the time. We have students now who are in college that are not even really care about their future. They're not thinking about starting a family. They're not thinking about starting a business because the world's going to end. Because for some reason, we decided to drag our kids into the climate conversation and leverage them for various agendas, which is criminal. I mean, back in the day when I grew up, my, the parents handled the problems, let the kids be kids. We have a PSYOP on our kids right now that is crushing their dreams. And so it's important to take your grandchildren down to the beach and your children down to the beach and talk about how abundant it is and how bright the future is in Northeast Florida and all of Florida and the Eastern Seaboard of the United States to help them snap out of this trance they've been put under with little kids books starting when they were two years old. And it's time for the grown-ups to step up and handle the things we need to handle and let our kids be kids. And shame on the people that are levering kids for climate discussions. Shame on them. It's criminal. It's like a psyop on our children. And I see them. It's real. So share the news that we're winning off our coast with everyone you can, especially the kids. Thank you guys for having me. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, great presentation. And uh, I'm going to open the floor for questions. If you can, uh, I guess, I raise your question. Your... Chris, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Barry. I was just going to say, just within the last day or so, I was hearing another thing. Maybe it was on uh, public radio about the shark fin issue with the countries where that is still a very popular thing and how many sharks are killed annually for their fins. What can be done about the culture of these countries, uh, whether it's Japan, China, or whomever, since it seems to be something in the Far East uh, is the real issue. Can you address that? Yeah, so we're already winning this one. You know, there is some sort of kind of path that's occurring with just allowing certain demographics to just age out. Uh, but you see the young people in China don't want shark fin soup. Uh, the ho big hotels won't carry it and serve it in their restaurants anymore. Uh, a lot of the airlines and shipping companies won't carry it. And so there's it's shrinking. We're winning that as well. So, you know, a lot of the famous musicians and athletes in China do this anti-rhino horn and anti-shark fin type of stuff they've been doing with the kids over there for the last 15, 20 years. And so they don't have the demand anymore. As the youth comes up, the demand falls, the supply gets more difficult. So we're we're on the slow path to winning this one right now. And, Great. Thank and you. Demand has dropped and will continue to do so. But you got to look at it like a 40 or 50 year kind of play, not a four year play. But we're on the right side of the curve now with the ocean's ability to recover versus the demand that they're sucking out of the ocean. Hey, Chris, this is Lisa Marie. Thank you so much for just amazing presentation um, and, and appreciate your point of view too, in general, with regards to our youth very much. So um, my question for you is somewhat related. I don't know that you can answer it. As you see this abundance of fish coming back, how about our reefs? Are we also seeing our reefs come back because of some of that addi additional um, activity? Yeah, we see, we, you know, there's, this is why sharks, right? And I'm not even a shark guy, you know? Um, so we see what happens in these reefs when the sharks are removed. They talk about bleaching and all these other things, but when the sharks are removed, 
you know, all those little fish that when you go die and you see them picking at the reef, well, yeah. they're not supposed to be able to pick at the reef 24 hours a day. They're supposed to be sharks moving through. So they got to hide about half the day, just like the seal and the bait. Um, so we see when the sharks return to reefs, everything has to hide a big part of the time, the pressure on the reef plummets, and then the reefs come back. Right. But it's the same thing. It's basically out of control grazing at various levels across the ecosystem because the appropriate predators aren't in place because if they were in place, it would affect the behavior of everything and bring their actions back into an abundant symphony, right? Rather than out of tune because they can go too much of this and not enough of that because the other thing that pushes them away is not there, right? It's all connected. Yeah. So yeah, we do see when we allow our sharks to come back, our reefs come back, they begin to team and you're going to, you're going to begin to see that we do have some, you know, other issues with temperature and bleaching that are, are you know, outside of the scope of this, right. but we do see um, tremendous recovery on reefs when we stop the shark fishing. Wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate that. I have a question for you. Um, I've absolutely been following your organization for many years. I got the tracker. I wouldn't go to the beach without looking at it first. Um, big fan. Um, I was uh, in St. Augustine, I think uh, maybe 2017, 2018. And I would never saw anything so big in my entire life float by about 15 feet from me and it looked black. So I was very confused until I watched Brian Williams on the NBC News that night talking about O-Search at Jack's Beach, tagging Mary Lee, this 16, 17 foot and shark. Lydia. When That's it true. came up on your um, cradle, as you call it, the shark was black. And so I knew that's what I saw and how her size was so large. I knew that was what I saw. I never saw any fins. I just saw like a snake turn, you know? And I figured that was from her fin to her tail. I said, oh my God, I was in the water with this very large shark. And then they said the name of the shark was named Mary Lee, which now I've read up that it's your mother's name. So is that the largest shark that you've caught and how do you name them? Very interesting. So that is, you know, when I think about sharks like Mary Lee, Mary Lee saved O-Search. There's a whole, you know, entrepreneurial financial story behind leveraging everything and going for it and not knowing if you're going to make it a few times. But uh, Mary Lee is, uh, when you think about sharks like her, she was in that 3,500 to 4,000 pound class, I think, between three and 4,000. And um, we've probably handled... 10 to 15 animals of that size over the years across the world. Um, we have dealt with two other animals that were significantly larger that both got away. You know, I think they were five or 6,000 pound white sharks. I think there's just not that many old sharks anymore because we crushed them in the seventies and eighties. So it's going to take us another 20 or 30 years. till we really get back to, you know, real giant fully grown white sharks. Um, so Mary Lee did love Jacksonville. She spent a lot of time off the beaches here. Um, you know, Mary Lee, you know, I don't know how much time you have. I got a lot of stories, but uh, Mary Lee saved O-Search. Mary Lee swam under the Jack's Beach Pier and I didn't know what to do. So I called the Jack's police. It was right after we tagged the first white sharks. We didn't know where we we're going to go. Next thing I know, like a month later, she's underneath the pier at Jack's Beach. So I called and said, hey, there's this shark there and this is a crazy call and so they they looked at the tracker and they shut down the beach and then mary lee like a few hours later pinged in five miles offshore and they opened it back up and the jacks community covered that and then that exploded o search's global awareness and what we were doing by bringing that sort of information to people in real time so mary lee was very very important um the sharks are typically named for the most part we try to name them after local areas local heroes, local towns. So people feel like uh, where the animal is caught, they feel ownership with that animal. They feel connected, like it's everyone's animal. Naming a shark like Mary Lee, uh, I thought at the time that it was gonna be the last shark we ever tagged and touched. I thought I was gonna go home and I thought I was gonna lose the ship and lose my house. And so I took the opportunity to name what I thought was gonna be the last shark I ever touched after my mom. Um, uh, and it turned out that shark went on a journey that changed our stars. So, um, you know, nor we do have donors. The problem is the average cost of tagging a shark is about $125,000 per shark. 
when you look at all of the costs associated with getting out there, getting the animal, tagging it and letting it go. So it's, it's kind of one of those things. And then, you know, there are certain corporate groups that pay for that, or they give us a half a million dollars and they get to name a shark and that sort of thing. Um, and obviously with the donors, we would do that, but we just don't talk about it too much because it's like a hundred thousand dollar number. It's kind of weird to even put out there, you know? Um, so that's, but for the most part, we try to give the names away wherever we're working so that the community there feels like it's their shark. You know, you like, you know, if you want to hold on to it, you got to give it away. Right. So um, that's the general, a lot of indigenous stuff too. Sometimes we like to do history, like, you know, Catherine, which is a big, big famous shark from back in the day down in Florida. She was named after Catherine Lee Bates, the author of America, the beautiful and a resident of Cape Cod. Right. So we do things like that. Then the students, are, they think they're watching sharks. Right. The next thing they know, they learn about Catherine Lee Bates in America, the beautiful. Right. So we can layer things. Thank you. Very cool. Chris, would yeah. you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see everybody? Oh, I'm sorry. I That's OK. I... Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Have a lovely and... day. I'll see you around Jacksonville. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Uh, everyone, Chris's uh, email and contact information is in the chat. Uh, so if you want to uh, copy that down to reach out to him, if you have any questions, <clears throat> excuse me, just a reminder, if we can uh, make sure that we go out and sign up for the meeting next week at the Igloos, and then we're back at the hotel on January 23rd. Our speaker will be Hannah Ober Holzer, oh, hope I said that Perfect. right, from Thrive's uh, Scholars. And then uh, another congratulations to our newest member, Tom Tappen. And uh, if I'd like to end the meeting with our four-way test of the things we think, do, and say. Uh, first, is it the truth? Oh, the truth. Second, is it fair to all, concern? all concerned? Third, will it build, we'll goodwill, build goodwill and, and better, better friendship? friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial, beneficial to all concerned? And I'm dinging, ding. <laughs>